Thank you for joining us on Zoom. Before we begin, I'd just like to go over a few etiquette pieces. Um, we will be taking questions um, at the end of our event. If you look to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section and a chat. What we're going to do is we'd like you to type your questions and comments into that area. We'll take notes and then come time at the end, we'll read them out loud and uh, answer them. Unfortunately, we cannot allow uh, audio and video because it uh, takes up too much bandwidth. So to get a clear picture, we're gonna stick with the chat. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, John McKnight is going to give us our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this virtual event of the One Book, One Region program. My name is John McKnight. Uh, I serve as Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion, which is a mouthful of a title at Connecticut College. And I'm really thrilled to be a part of this partnership with so many uh, wonderful New London neighbors and, and the surrounding region. So my role tonight, as Jessica said, is to acknowledge the land here in Southeastern Connecticut. Uh, we find ourselves in an extraordinary time in our history where we're uh, recognizing uh, the historical import of uh, you know, writing history and acknowledging the violence that has um, transpired throughout the history of this nation. And so uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land that we um, currently inhabit here in southeastern Connecticut. Hopefully you can see my screen. One Book, One Region would like to acknowledge the land in southeastern Connecticut and to honor the native peoples who were its first inhabitants. Specifically, we honor the Mashantucket Pequots, Eastern Pequots, Mohegans, and other tribal nations who are indigenous to Namiog, now called New London, and the land surrounding coastal Algonquin, also known as the Long Island Sound region. We appreciate your ancestors' careful stewardship of the land, of the land over many generations and acknowledge the suffering endured through the historical period of settler colonialism. Finally, we express gratitude for the opportunity to live as neighbors in this region and we seek future opportunities for greater connection and partnership. So with that, I would like to turn over the program to the Dean of the College at Connecticut College, Jefferson Singer. And thank you all again for being here with us. Thank you very much, John. And, and uh, thank you uh, for all of, uh, who are attending. I wanna say just a little bit of word about what this One Book, One Region um, partnership means to Connecticut College and how important it is to us. Uh, it began about four years ago and we uh, had Brian Stevenson come to Connecticut College and partnered with One Book, One Region before Brian Stevenson was a household name. We, we have a habit of doing that, of bringing important people to this region, maybe before they really get fully famous. And Betty Ann can tell you a little bit about that in a second. But what this partnership means to us at Connecticut College is a way of connecting with our community in a deep and shared experience. And I think that that is more important than ever um, because of the what we're going through right now with the pandemic. We can't all be physically in place with each other, but this is a way in which we can connect virtually and still feel a sense of camaraderie, a sense of fellowship. And what better way to do that around a shared reading? So we're very excited to bring uh, in the fall um, Joy Harjo to the campus as part of the One Book, One Region to talk about her uh, writing, uh, Crazy Brave and her poetry. So this is just one more way in which we feel that sense of partnership. And before I turn it over to Betty Ann Ryder, I do wanna just say some thank yous. We are funded for this endeavor through the Community Foundation, through the Palmer Fund, um, through our uh, relationship with Bank Square Books, and through our wonderful relationship with the libraries throughout New London County. Um, the, this is a relationship that we hope will go on for years and years, and we're, we're thrilled to be part of it. So now I, I'd love to turn things over to Betty Ann Ryder, who's gonna tell you even more about One Book, One Region and some of its activities. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you again this year. I'm Betty Ann Ryder, and I'm here tonight to welcome you on behalf of One Book, One Region as one of the founding members of the project. 2020 marks our 18th year, and although the current situation created some hurdles, 
I think you'll find that we've planned another exciting community-wide read. This year, we're inviting you to join us in reading Crazy Brave by Joy Harjo, the poet laureate of the United States. And although Crazy Brave is a memoir, we also want to challenge you to read Harjo's poetry. This is a first. In our 18 years, Harjo will be our first poet, and we hope you enjoy getting to know a bit about her life and then exploring her poems. Please visit our website, onebookoneregion.org, for the latest information on program offerings. Libraries throughout the region are planning virtual book discussions. We're also looking for your stories. You are all asked to submit a one-sentence memoir to be shared in a New London County compilation called A Life in One Line. We want to hear about your life during this unusual time, so please share one short sentence with us. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Whether you've been with us since the beginning or are new to One Book, One Region, we welcome you and look forward to your participation. And now we'd like to share a short video clip of Joy Harjo reading her poem, American Sunrise. An American Sunrise. We were running out of breath as we ran to meet ourselves, we were surfacing the edge of our ancestors' fights and ready to strike. It was difficult to lose days in the Indian bar if you were straight, easy if you played full and drank to remember to forget. We made plans to be professional and did, and some of us could sing. When we drove to the edge of the mountains with a drum, we made sense of our beautiful, crazed lives under the starry stars, sin was invented by the Christians, as was the devil we sang. We were the heathens, but needed to be saved from them. Thin chance. We knew we were all related in this story. A little gin will clarify the dark and make us all feel like dancing. We had something to do with the origins of blues and jazz. I argued with the music as I filled the jukebox with dimes in June. Four years later, and we still want justice. We are still America. We thank you, Gwendolyn Brooks. <laughs> Such powerful and moving words. Thank you, Joy Harjo. Good evening. I am Tracy Reiser, a member of the One Book, One Region Committee. It is my distinct honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Sandy Grande. Sandy is a professor of education and the director of the Center for the Critical Study of Race and Ethnicity at Connecticut College. Her research and teaching interfaces Native American and Indigenous studies, education and critical theory toward the development of a more nuanced analysis of the colonial present. She was recently awarded the Ford Foundation Senior Fellowship. Her book, Red Pedagogy, Native American Social and Political Thought was recently published in a 10th anniversary edition. And a Portuguese translation is anticipated to be published in Brazil in 2021. She has also published numerous book chapters and articles, including Accumulation of the Primitive, the Limits of Liberalism and the Politics of Occupy Wall Street, the Journal of Settler Colonial Studies, American Indian Geographies of Identity and Power, Harvard Educational Review, and Red Ding, The Word and the World in Paulo Freire's Intellectual Roots Toward Historicity in Praxis. She is also a founding member of the New York Stands for Standing Rock a group of scholars and activists that works to forward the aims of Native American and indigenous sovereignty and resurgence. As one of their projects, they published the Standing Rock Syllabus. Professor Grande is well loved by the college students who learn in new ways in her classrooms. In Crazy Brave, 
Joy Harger writes a beautiful paragraph about learning all the poetry and all the words in all the library books in the world, but then asking, quote, and who decided what knowledge was important to know and understand, unquote. Professor Grande is one who guides her students and others to think critically about learning and knowledge. She encourages us to continually re-examine what knowledge is important to know and to understand. In addition to her scholarly work, she has provided elder care for her parents for over 10 years and remains the primary caregiver for her 92-year-old father. Sandy has a huge heart and deep compassion. And along with her brilliant mind, these fuel her unending strength to work for equity and justice for all. Please join me in extending the warmest welcome to Professor Sandy Grande. Oh, wow. Thank you, Tracy. It's so lovely. I've been on leave, as Tracy noted, I've um, uh, been on leave through the, through the um, generosity of the Ford Foundation this year. So I miss my colleagues uh, very, very much. So it's lovely to see your faces. I wish we could all be in person. Um, uh, it's really also wonderful to be invited to be part of the, the magic really that is One Book, One Region. Uh, I was part of that first crew that brought Brian Stevenson and it was such a, a wonderful experience. Um, and even better that we're all here to celebrate the inimitable Joy Harjo. Um, as the current poet, poet laureate, uh, Joy's, Joy's really one of the most important figures in Native American arts and culture. Um, and while her life certainly has its hardships and some controversy, I think one th thing that we gain from her story is really a narrative around resiliency. Um, and right now, particularly in this moment, when Native communities and Black communities are hit so hard by the pandemic um, and the ongoing harms of state violence, it's really it was really a wonderful opportunity to be drawn back to a voice like Harjo's, who kind of reminds us of the restorative powers of poetry, art, and music. Um, so thank you all again for inviting me to be part of this project. Um, I'll start by saying I identify as, as Quechua, which means I'm not Muscogee, which is Joy's people. So some aspects of her story are really not for me to discuss. Um, but as an educator, I'm very interested in what we can learn from her story. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll have some brief remarks in a few different categories. I'm just gonna start with her people, the Muscogee, then talk about the person, her, herself, Joy, and her work make some connections to the present, and then end with some suggestions of how we might all stay involved uh, with Native issues, if that's something that you feel compelled to do. Um, as just mentioned, I'm happy to take any questions. My, my remarks will be fairly brief. Um, and if you don't have a question, I really love hearing from people if there's a quote or a passage that stood out to you uh, and resonated for you. I really love hearing uh, what other people get from, from from a reading of a, of a shared text. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, Joy, as we learn, is a citizen of the Muscogee Nation. Originally, their territories were in uh, the Southeast Woodlands, mainly Alabama and Georgia. And like most tribal nations, uh, very robust community before settler invasion. Um, they were a trading community. They worked the land. Um, and then after after settlers came, they became Creeks, actually, uh, because in that area, if you can imagine on a map, sort of the area around Georgia, Alabama, maybe a bit of northern Florida, there's lots of little waterways there. So the settlers refer to them as the Creek Indians, uh, but they call themselves the Muscogee. Um, the Muscogee are also part of the what have come to be known as the five civilized tribes. Um, the others are Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole. Um, and they, I guess earned is a, is a funny way to say it, but that title, uh, because they were among the first to adopt colonialist practices, um, such as Christianity, participation in the market economy, um, written constitutional governance, um, and also um, somewhat notoriously plantation slavery. Um, and so the settlers 
imposed these practices and saw their taking up the practices as evidence of them being civilized, hence the sort of five civilized tribes. Um, but these are really, I think it's important to understand that these are practices that were more often than not adopted under duress. Um, and to paraphrase Dene scholar Glenn Cuthard, who says, when choices are made under threat of dispossession, they're ultimately little more than, than paid ransom. Um, and they did pay dearly. If you, if you imagine, again, back at the time, that was sort of a different kind of a hotspot, right? A different, uh, different kind of crown zero at the time. Um, so they were often in these negotiations uh, that were life and death uh, in terms of uh, trying to imagine what kind of future they might have. Um, things really came to a head sometime around the mid-19th mid, uh, century, which is the height of Indian removal. And at that time, uh, a handful of, of Creek leaders, again, this is also something fairly common, um, signed a treaty uh, that ceded away their lands in exchange ostensibly for protection and land out west in the, quote, New Indian Territory, which for them ended up mostly being Oklahoma. Um, but those leaders that signed really had no jurisdiction or representation or power uh, as far as the, the peoples, the, the Muscogee peoples were concerned. Um, and as we all know, or, you know, or if you don't know, the story from there is, is none of the promises were kept. Um, you know, the Indians that were moved west were often uh, forced through battalions, the most notorious being the Trail of Cheers in the Cherokee. Uh, I think somewhere around 4,000 Cherokee died on the Trail of Tears. Some people, some Muscogees and, and other members of the Five tried to stay behind because there was a provision in the treaty that if they gave up, essentially if they promised to not be Indian, to live as settlers, to kind of uh, live on a parcel of land and to farm, um, that they would be free to stay. Um, so some did stay behind, but that didn't turn out to be the case either. They were raided, they were killed, they were traumatized and eventually also moved. Um, some, you know, did manage to escape, um, but <clears throat> for the most part, um, it was, is, it was a, a time of very intense death and destruction. Um, so all of that is sort of just to understand a bit of the context in which uh, Joy Harjo was born into. This is sort of the history of her people. Um, and there's sort of a common notion among Native scholars to talk about historical trauma, um, which, is, which is a kind of a trauma experienced by a people and that is passed on generationally. So whether one person, an individual, it's not an individual's concept of, of trauma, but it's whether an individual experiences the event or not, that this trauma is carried generationally. Um, and when I read her story, her memoir, um, I think you can see some of what she carried with her and how she carried it with her um, in the way that she narrates herself. Um, so to kind of, to move to Joy more specifically, um, you know, it's, it's again, all the more remarkable that this was the history that she was born into. By the time she was born, her family uh, was already in Oklahoma. Um, and that's where she raised and nurtured her talents. Um, we learned that she started out as a visual artist. I didn't know that either. Um, and a musician, she plays the sax that I knew because I think fairly recently, maybe, I don't know, five or six years ago, she won the Native American Music Award for Best Female Artist of the Year. And it was only later that she came back to poetry, or came to poetry and back to writing. Um, I think it's also fair to say that Joy was of a particular era in Native history. She was a child of the 60s. And I think everything that comes to mind when you think of, of people that were of that generation and era um, also are, are present in her life. Um, but what it meant to be a Native person in that time, particular woman, I think, uh, was to negotiate these really um, various spaces that were quite constrained for women. So it's the highly masculinist spaces, spaces of the American Indian movement, as an example. Um, um, there was like the space of the Hollywood Indian, again, dominated by sort of white constructions of what India, who Indians were, and also um, very sort of masculinist space also. There was the whole kind of hippie flower child movement and the kinds of cultural appropriation that happened there. 
Uh, so there was all those kinds of spaces and then still like the really harsh conditions uh, of government policies, um, whether that's the boarding school era, boarding schools, um, it was the tail end of Indian termination policies, which is a policy of the US government um, to, to terminate their status on reservation communities and to move them out to city to, as an opportunity, move them to city relocation cities like uh, Cleveland, San Francisco, uh, Chicago. These are all relocation cities and Indians were like literally given a bus ticket and they said, when you get there, they'll, you'll go to this employment center and they'll give you a job and it clearly didn't work out that way. So all this is, um, you know, her more immediate kind of context, um, which I think, again, uh, in even more restrictive space then than now of, of how to craft your yourself, your identity, uh, as a, as a, specifically as a Native woman. And I think we see that a bit in her story. Um, so like moving to the, to the actual book, um, I think first, just to start with the title of Crazy Brave, um, which is also her name, right? That's the translation of Harjo in, in, Mus in Muskogee. Um, so Harjo is a very common name uh, among the Muskogee. It's like Smith or Yazi among the Navajo. Um, and Harjo, again, as she shares with us, means crazy brave. Another trans translation is reckless in battle. I find that uh, maybe a little bit more um, consonant with her story, with her particular story. Um, but what I found really interesting, which I didn't know prior to reading the book, is that Harjo isn't her given name, but the name of her paternal grandmother. I don't think, or at least I don't recall, the exact point at which she took that name. Um, but I found that so poignant, given her story, given how she narrates herself and her life, that she chose to be Harjo. She chose to be crazy brave. She chose to be reckless in battle. Or, or if she didn't see it as a choice, she chose, chose to re-narrate her life as being reckless in battle or crazy brave. So um, that was something I learned that, that I was really taken by. Um, I think the other aspect of the book that might be worth mentioning is, is the, the division, the four, she organizes the book uh, uh, by the four directions. Um, North, South, East, West, uh, beginning in the East and moving clockwise, which is which is a common way of social organizing a among a lot of Native peoples, but particularly, I think, Plains Indians. Um, so I'm not aware of the connection of the four directions among, as a traditional Muskogee, part of their uh, traditional life ways. But again, um, since she's from this era where there was sort of a kind of pan-Indian identity that was emergent and prevalent at the time for lots of different reasons. Um, it's interesting to me that she took on that structure. And for that reason, it reads even more for me as a creation story. And clearly it's her own creation story. She's bringing herself into the world or she's sharing how she imagined herself uh, coming into the world. Um, from there, her story in some ways uh, unfolds in a way I think that moves through what um, many of us might see as the common tropes of kind of an Indian story, which is poverty, alcoholism, teenage pregnancy, sexual abuse, domestic violence. Um, and so I was, I was to honestly a little bit troubled by that, um, but then also kind of remembering or like situating her in this <clears throat> particular era of um, I guess narrating one's own Indian identity helped me make sense of that a little bit. But it's also why I think I, I felt more compelled by the second half of the book, where she starts to share, and she does this throughout, she sort of threads throughout her various modes of survivance, which is, is a term that Gerald Wisner um, coined, which is um, for Native peoples that um, who work and struggle to more than just survive. So what's what's the um, uh, what's the combination of just of surviving, but also thriving in our own particular way? So he talks about survivance. So her modes of survivance were cl clearly uh, the arts, right, and school, books, art, school, music, um, and again, initially not writing. 
Um, and so in some ways, her story again becomes attached to kind of the quintessential American story where salvation comes through education. Um, and of course, as a teacher of teachers, I kind of like that, I resonate with that. Um, but I think it's also important to note that that she went to, it wasn't until she attended the um, Institute of American Indian Arts, IAIA, which is, remains today uh, in a very strong um, school for very talented uh, Native peoples, um, continues to be, I think, a refuge for Native students and faculty. Um, but it's a very particular kind of school. So it's, it's not like she found this thriving in the, in the sort of um, traditional American public school. Um, and as Tracy sort of mentioned at the beginning, she really, I think some of her kind of um, sharper writing, some of her beautiful pose and prose and passages come through in this, in this part of the book for me. Um, and I too liked when she talked about um, um, her view of knowledge in a way. Um, and I'll read the, I think it's around the same lines maybe that you chose out too, Tracy. Um, she says, and what happened, I wondered, if you read and took in every book in the library of the world, learn the name of every seashell, every war, and could quote every line of poetry, what would you do with all that knowing? Would it be the kind of knowledge that could free you? Or would infinite knowledge bind you with the junky posturing of human beings who didn't appear to be that wise? And who decided what knowledge was important to know and understand? Um, and I find those kinds of questions, especially again, maybe in this moment, very provocative. Because I often say to my students when we struggle with the inequities around education, I say, well, what if I could wave a magic wand and everybody, everybody went to a beautiful school, everybody had the latest books and the best lab equipment and whatever. Um, we would still be stuck with this question of who's deciding what we're learning in those spaces. Um, and to me, those are some of the most important questions, uh, certainly of the day. And then she moves, her story comes to almost what feels like a little bit of an abrupt ending. So I'm curious to talk with other people about that, with this kind of poem about doorways, which is, of course, makes a whole lot of sense. She feels herself in this space between panic and love, um, which maybe we all feel that right now. <laughs> is we're constantly between panic and love, but it's sort of a teaser for her, I think, of coming attractions when she just comes to her life as a poet, um, and you sort of feel like her life is almost just beginning in that moment. So I'm assuming there's gonna be a part two at some point. Um, so to continue a bit to the kind of uh, connections to present day, um, obviously the Muscogee are still a very vibrant nation. There's like over 80,000 enrolled citizens in the Muscogee Nation. Um, and they still continue to endure attempts to diminish their, their sovereignty and the size of their territories. Um, as we're contemplating pandemics and, and kind of other sorts of other kind of uh, racism in medicine, um, there's that kind of moment when she's giving birth to her son, which she talks almost incidentally about um, almost being sterilized. Uh, and during the 60s and 70s, the Indian IHS, the Indian Health Services, um, sterilized an estimated 25% of Native women in their childbearing years. And that seems outrageous to us, and it is outrageous and violent. But just last week, we learned that a state hospital in New York is un in New Mexico, sorry, is under investigation for targeting um, Native women, they go into the hospital and they'd be targeted for COVID testing um, by zip code, which you would learn what that someone was part of a res reservation community by their zip codes, and then immediately test sent for testing and separated for their from their newborn children um, until they got results back, which took sometimes several um, several days. Um, just tragic to think of of women and their brand new babies separated um, at birth. She made some reference, I think, um, of people dying from tuberculosis. Um, so there was, through Indian history, there's been, that was another pandemic um, that disproportionately affected Native communities as a result of racism and, and gross criminal neglect. Um, again, including children in boarding schools who were subjected to some of the most horrific conditions. 
Um, and then the other thing I think I'll mention of kind of present day, so the Muskogee, as I talked about earlier, um, as um, one of the five civilized tribes uh, did engage in practice in plantation slavery. Um, and so there's a group of people, the Muskogee freedmen, um, that are on the rolls as Muskogee as they entered into their communities, um, but have never been recognized, even as late as 2018. So just a couple of years ago, the freedmen filed a lawsuit against the tribe to have their line lineage and citizenship recognized, and it's still not settled. So there's anti-Black racism in any communities, just like every other community. Um, um, and I think it's just, this is just a real moment. Um, and so it's even more important, I think, to see um, joint movements of solidarity um, that were, that you see much more commonly now, if you following what's happening in Seattle in the kind of the chop zones, um, Black Lives Matter has been working with the Duwamish people together to kind of craft that space. Um, lots of different organizations, the Red Nation as an example, um, have um, put forth uh, statements of solidarity and support of Black Lives Matter uh, and of people of a people's movement more broadly. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say, if, if, if the kind of the life and future of Native peoples is something that folks are interested in, there's things we can do right here in Connecticut. As uh, we were talking prior that just yesterday, the New London, I think it's on the news, all the various Columbus statues that are coming down. Uh, New London joined uh, New Haven, Hartford, and Middletown last night. Um, and I think the Mashantucka Pequots are there as we speak, um, acknowledging uh, that momentous occasion. Um, Chris Newell, who works with the awesome folks of Akumat, uh, Jason Mancini and Andana Spears, who do lots of work in the state um, with schools, um, was uh, let me know that there's a law on the books already in Connecticut um, where the governor is supposed to declare the last Friday of September as Connecticut Indian Day to provide resources for educating about uh, Connecticut's um, indigenous nations. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as we know, the state has not been in compliance with that law. So no time like the present um, to put some pressure on that. Um, it, this, the, and I didn't know this. Um, so there's, there's the law around um, declaring and providing resources for Connecticut Indian Day. Um, and then there's also already on the books um, um, where the State Board of Education needs to assist uh, and encourage local and regional boards to make education uh, curricula uh, to be inclusive of Native American history. Um, so some of us are aware, some of you might be aware that there's a new ethnic studies bill that now mandates the histories and teachings of Black and Latinx communities um, by 2022 in public schools. So I always wondered why uh, Native peoples weren't included in that, but the reason could be is because there's these other laws on the books, but they're just not being uh, enacted upon. Um, so beyond that, I would just say continue to join the join the struggles uh, uh, against colonial statues, against school mascots, uh, and for school curricula, and certainly continue to read. And if people are looking for um, suggestions, I'm happy to offer that. And that's my remarks. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, we're going to give our audience a little moment to go ahead and type some questions into our comments and our chat area. While we do that, I'm just going to play another short video of Joy reading poetry. stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. 
that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give birth. You are evidence of her mother and her mother and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk with them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember that you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the dance, language is, that life is. Remember. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to take a moment to ask some questions, get some answers, and just continue the dialogue um, that Sandy had started with us. So taking a look at um, our first question in the chat, can you provide more information about a life in one line? Well, actually, I can do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. So one of the things we are doing this year for One Book, One Region is we are asking our community to write one-sentence memoirs uh, that can be submitted through the One Book, One Region website, onebookoneregion.org. Um, and those will be published in a book. A uh, community-wide memoir, uh, just detailing our lives here in New London County. We're inviting all ages, um, every every town, every citizen to participate. Um, so yes, that answers that question. Um, so taking a look at what we had talked about today, um, you know, you used a phrase historical trauma that I think we're hearing a lot about, and I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about that. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll point, so when I have an opportunity, I'll also highlight uh, some works from some other Native scholars. So the um, that work was championed by a uh, Lakota scholar, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. Um, we used to be neighbors in New York, um, and she's now, uh, she's at the University of New Mexico. Um, and, you know, I guess not to get into too much of the details, but it's, it's when um, so in the, in the instance of indigenous communities, uh, we're talking about an American genocide, right? Where such a, a traumatic experience has happened to, to a peoples. Um, certainly there's other instances of, of genocide, uh, enacted against the Jewish peoples as an example, the Armenian peoples as an example. And so once something that horrific happens to a peoples, uh, particularly at the hands of the state, uh, what are the memories? What 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 are the residual effects of that? You know, there's stories that get carried about that uh, generation to generation, and there's even a sense, um, and I know much less about this literature, but there's even a sense that there's something um, that gets even more kind of by encoded in our bodies and our spirits and our bodies of this experience um, that gets carried through. And unless you attend to it, unless uh, I know for Native peoples, we have. Uh, ceremonies for other peoples, or might be other kind of religious practices, but unless you attend to and, and have a sense of and kind of honor the past uh, and the experiences of your ancestors and your um, relatives, um, there just needs to be an awareness that you can carry that through in, in multiple ways, and that could have lots of different effects on, on one's individual family life, um, even though in this moment, you aren't experiencing the same thing. Thank you, that was very succinct and powerful for today. Um, so taking a look at our chat, there is a question about um, you know, current struggles and can you tell us a bit more about the efforts to bring water to reservations in the West? Yeah, boy, <laughs> that's a long history there of, of how, these, how, how particular nations have been denied water. Um, that's now clearly a global phenomenon, whether you're talking about Flint, Michigan, or, uh, you know, peoples uh, in the Amazonian region. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, um, kind of struggles over water now. But um, 
you know, much of it has been deliberate through policy, like in a similar way that uh, redlining has happened in Black communities. There's been lots of ways in which, uh, I mean, certainly people's being moved to places where there aren't water. So if you take, as an example, the Muskogee who uh, made their life admits all this fresh water and then some of them moved to, to the desert. Um, not only is that a completely different way of life that one has to now forge, but it's, um, you're with different, you know, uh, as Joy uh, said in her, her second poem, there's a way in which uh, beyond humans, we have relatives. And so now you're, you're away from your own relatives, you're in this other place. Um, so there's certainly ways in which um, government policy led to denial of water. Um, and for a period of time, there was ways in which people um, people's own traditional ways, as long as they had access, um, some access to water, chose um, not to maybe have, you know, your coal or faucet, like you didn't have to have. So there, there might have been a way which became a, a, a kind of a practice. Um, but now it's very clearly a public health issue and people have been, um, different communities have ad advocating uh, for access to fresh water for decades and decades and decades. Um, and it's tied up with um, mineral rights. It could be like you, um, uh, for lots of folks uh, and beyond again, indigenous communities, while even if you get moved to a certain land or territory, um, there's a sense of, of like that you might be living on the land, but there's nothing about the land that you own and you certainly don't under, own anything underneath, have rights to anything underneath the land. So, um, Billionaires across the world are buying aquifers because they can. Um, and lots of folks don't know <laughs> that um, an aquifer somewhere in Central America or South America could be owned by somebody here in the US. Um, and so, uh, and it's very likely owned by a billionaire somewhere in, in the West. Um, so it's a. It's probably one of the biggest health crisis crises in the world right now. It's a crisis for all of us, even if you have the privilege to go to your kitchen and open the water. Um, you know, it's if you can imagine like we're all pulling from the same source on some level, and just because we have it there and downstream they don't, at some point it's going to come to your doorway. So it's something we should all be attentive to. Um, uh, and I think it's been shown a new light. I think certainly in Standing Rock when, when um, pipelines certainly threaten water um, and now in the pandemic, particularly around uh, in communities that have very little access to water like the Hopi and Navajo communities specifically, um, the Lakota communities to, to also to some extent, but it's very severe in the, in the Southwest because it's desert there. Um, but the struggles continue. So there's lots of different ways to support that for people. It's a very good uh, point that there are ways to support. And I think it's a struggle for um, an individual to know what, what the best and most effective ways would be. Do you have any suggestions for our viewers on um, what they can do as one person to make a difference? Sure. I would say get involved at the community level uh, you know I would in fact so ironically I was just looking I guess they tested the waters in and we just got a report out from MDC or something and I looked myself on like what's the lead content and it's fine okay here where my dad lives but there's some communities in Hartford County where the lead content looked pretty high to me and it was a little and I didn't know that you know so where so I think it's just being informed of your local community um, and then certainly if there's a community for some that there's some attachment to for one reason or another, um, you feel connected to whether that's, you know, folks in the Hopi Nation that are working or folks in Flint, Michigan um, that are struggling, um, you know, there's uh, ways to get uh, inform oneself about the local communities there um, and find ways to support. But I, I always advocate, I think, going local and then certainly being conscious of the kinds of water, um, water one, um, consumes, um, themselves is certainly another way. And then, and then I think being educated, uh, and it, you know, it's an ongoing process for myself of like at this whole other level for all of us of, who is hoarding the water, you know, and oftentimes it's like five different companies. It's like Coca-Cola and Nestle 
and how is that happening? You know, I think that is a big part of the education. Um, and how is it that, um, you know, there's certain communities, um, trying to think of where it was in Mexico, but it was cheaper for buy, folks to buy Coke than, than water. They could didn't have access to, to fresh water, but was, Coke was cheaper than water. Um, and, and Coke was a huge presence in the, in the, in that particular community as a corporate entity. So, uh, and within their own political system. So, it, I mean, I think educating oneself on kind of the big picture is also, um, very important. Thank you. Um, so I'm seeing a bit of a theme in some of our questions about, um, you know, the, the invisibility of, um, you know, Native people and the issues that they face today and how it seems as though our education system and our society in general just kind of looks at it as something from the past and that we're very much part of the present. Um, so looking at some of these comments, um, it was requested that we talk a little bit about the missing and murdered Indigenous women and how it's not being talked about in our media. Do you feel comfortable talking about that with us today? Sure, I could, um, I could um, talk a little bit about it. Uh, it's definitely much more um, part of the discourse uh, uh, up north in Canada to, to our neighbors, um, the I Don't Know More movement, uh, or some of the women that really brought a lot of attention initially to the, murder, uh, the, the uh, phenomenon of murdering and missing Indigenous women in Canada. Um, certainly, Native women um, are targets. They have been targets historically, as we learned, whether it's a kind of a project of sterilization, um, there was often in the period of when uh, the government was paying for um, scalps, for native uh, scalps, um, which is, you know, we still have a football team by that horrible name, slur. Um, that's next. I think after Columbus, if people want to point their, <laughs> their energies there, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, you know, pregnant women were the high, you get the highest bounty for the scalp of a pregnant woman, native woman. Um, and all that, again, is part of a kind of politics uh, of elimination and erasure and genocide. Um, and that continues to be. I think the other, um, um, I guess, issue that ends up exacerbating uh, the issue is, is, and this is a whole history of law that I think would be too complicated, but um, the tensions between uh, um, jurisdiction in law, in law and who can be tried on whose land. So if somebody um, not of a reservation, uh, member of a reservation community uh, commits a crime such as rape or murder or assault, um, it's almost like a no man's land depending on what community you're talking about because they can't be held and they don't, uh, the tribal courts don't have jurisdiction over this person. Um, and then because they didn't commit a crime technically within the bounds of the U.S., but in a different nation, they aren't tried outside either. So for the longest time, um, you know, often folks who are supposed to uphold the law um, took advantage of that. Um, you see a lot of crime and rape around um, man, what they call man camps, which is where these the pipelines are, where you have an influx of workers into a community um, where it didn't exist before, and they come up overnight um, wherever there's oil. Um, and you just have huge populations of men not of that community and, um, you know, often target Native women who um, get disappeared um, uh, or talk about as being disappeared, but they're clearly being murdered, and sometimes their bodies are found, sometimes they're not. So. Um, why isn't it more in the media? I think I think it's you know um, all the reasons that we might think of. You know, it's people aren't at least I don't know. Daily is probably too much, but it often comes up that people aren't aware that Native people still exist in the U.S. Um, even though there's I think close to five million Indigenous people still living in what is now the United States. Um, and that has been, that's the product of a real long, 500 years long kind of project of erasure. Um, and so that plays out in so many different ways. So, you know, and my students, some, sometimes they feel bad or they didn't know this. And I'm like, don't feel bad because you weren't, you weren't supposed to know. You weren't, you were actually really schooled well to not know certain things. 
Um, and so, you know, the, the project here from this point is just to kind of learn and educate ourselves. That is a fantastic point about uh, the lack of education in our own school systems and curriculum. And we have someone who is calling in from the Coast Salish Territory in British Columbia, which in Canada, which is not at all local to us, which is very exciting that we were able to spread one book, one region outside of our own tiny region. Um, and they would like to point out that place-based learning is becoming more accepted as a form of decolonized learning. Joy's poem, Remember, speaks to the importance of land. Is place-based learning from an indigenous perspective widely accepted in your region? Or is there a local education agreement that is inclusive of the local indigenous peoples? Um, this is something that's particularly interesting for this uh, commenter because they are an indigenous educator themselves. Yeah. To that I will say not yet, not yet. And a lot of these people right here, particularly our Khan College peeps, are working on that, um, but it's a you know it's a constant effort and and absolutely land based education and place based education for those who are not indigenous um, is something that I, I think uh, makes a lot of sense for so many different reasons. Um, you know, as I again say to my students, <clears throat> I don't know that it makes sense. Um, I mean, clearly there are things that as people who inhabit the same place. Uh, geographic location, that there's um, there's value in shared knowledge, but there's also value in specificity and the particular. Um, and so many students go to schools of all kinds, not public, not just public or private, but schools of all kinds and not know what's right outside in their backyard and the history of the place that they live in. Um, and again, I think that's a kind of it's it's deliberate, but it might be not always fully conscious way to kind of 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 a mode of detachment. And what does detachment serve? I think we have to think about what does detachment serve, and how does that work <clears throat> to serve other aims and goals? And uh, to me, it's absolutely critical um, for a system built on capital, as an example, to foster and nurture detachment. Um, from your local environments, from um, from the land specifically, um, but also from peoples, because it's so contingent upon mobility and it's so contingent upon extraction and accumulation. You can't engage in a lot of the foundational principles of capital without detachment first. Um, so to struggle for that, to struggle for place-based education and land-based education is indeed, I would agree with this person, absolutely um, a component of a decolonial education. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that you mentioned Khan College and higher education in general. There was a comment submitted to us before um, our Zoom meeting started, and it was that many young people um, that are Native American have the opportunity to attend college, and many are not choosing to attend. And there are many factors that might um, contribute to this. Do you have any suggestions on how to encourage more students and young Native Americans to pursue higher education? I mean that I, that's that's a that's a good question. It's, I think it's complicated, right? I think um, to Joy's point, right? She said, um, if education looks a particular way and it holds a particular set of values um, that are counter to my own. At first, we have to, you know, what would be the purpose of it? You know, like who's deciding what knowledge is important? Um, and that's a long going theme and tension between settler structures of schooling and native schooling, native notions of education and schooling, um, in terms of what's important. Um, there's lots of structural barriers, obviously. Um, I think there's lots of desire. Um, I think persistence is, is, is a problem because. Folks go, I mean, you often have to go away to school, right? Um, or that's what's valued. And, and again, it's a mode of detachment. Um, and it's hard for um, certain students to, to go, not just go away, but to go away to a place that um, doesn't really support who they are as people. And so you're caught, and it's not just Native students, but you feel caught in the space of either I, you know, to thrive in this location, I have to commit a sort of cultural suicide. I um, erase who I am, um, or I don't, or I choose to be who I am and then I struggle. And that's not a choice we should put any student in. So that, that's the work that all of us here, I think, um, 
uh, take very seriously. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of desire out there among uh, Native students to continue into persistent education. Uh, I think we have to ask, what are we educating for? Those of us that work in uh, institutions of higher education, we have to think uh, carefully, especially now. It means so much now. We have to rethink what we're doing, and we are rethinking uh, what we're doing. Um, and some of us have been pushing things, and now there's like an opening conceptual and and literal opening um, to make some shifts and um, I think now's the time. Thank you. Uh, we are wrapping up towards our end so I do have one question I'd like to ask. Um, you know everybody here has been submitting some wonderful questions and we have some that we haven't been able to touch on. Uh, with that in mind do you have any books or media that you recommend we turn towards to start educating ourselves um, and making that that difference in that conscious choice? Oh gosh so many but um, since we're pressed on time I always the the good words of the folks of the Red Nation, they've got a podcast. You can follow um, them on all social media. Uh, media and Deacon is another um, uh, podcast that comes out of Canada also. Um, Native America Calling is, is a show out of NPR. Um, and maybe as a starter book, just Indigenous People's History of the Roxanne dunbar Ortiz's book, there's, there's actually the Indigenous Peoples of uh, what is Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, I hope I'm not getting the title wrong, Roxanne, if you're right here. And then there's also a young adult version of that. So I think I, I would mention that for that reason, because you can read it across generations in your own home and learn quite a bit there. A very good introductory text uh, on, on um, the history of Native peoples and what is now the U.S. Thank you very much. And I'd like to invite all of our attendees to seek out their public libraries and continue the discussion in your community uh, with your families, with your book discussion groups. And we're just gonna wrap up with uh, Jefferson, Jefferson Singer popping in and concluding us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you, Sandy, so much. I've always considered you a teacher to me, to our community, and you demonstrated that in every way possible tonight in teaching us. And, helping us start the kickoff of this. Really, this is a beginning now of education that we can have for the next months to come. And I'm excited to think that the incoming students at Connecticut College will all be reading Crazy Brave and be able to talk about it in their classes. I also am excited about the University of Connecticut Avery Point. I know that they're also involved in thinking and reading about these um, issues. Uh, I, I do want to thank Kim Sanchez, whose face has been uh, there all night for all the work that she's done to bring forward this uh, project and, and really all of the committee of One Book, One Region for their, their efforts and the programs that are going forward. I am excited to say that on September 14th, and we can't say whether in person or virtual, um, but we do know that on September 14th, which is a Monday night at 7 p.m., we will have the honor of having Joy Harjo be with us and I, I hope she will um, talk about her book. She will also, I hope, read some poetry for us that, that night. So uh, there'll be many other events, but we uh, hope to share those events together. And again, we're just thrilled about a partnership that we have and a way that we can learn and grow together and, and try to build a stronger community for all of us. So thank you for being here tonight. Good night, and we hope to see you in the events in the months ahead. Good night.